Good afternoon and greetings of love and peace from our congregation in the Tri-Cities, especially from our family. We had the great privilege to be gathered together to give thanks. We're going to uh, look at the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verse 11 through 25, with that prayer that our hearts will be thankful above all for the great salvation, which is so full and free. So we read this afternoon in the name of Jesus, 10th chapter of Hebrews 11 through 25. And every preach standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. This is thy holy word, O Father, sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. So we have the Hebrew writer that the church is called. Apostle Paul wrote it, and I'm fine with that. But there is no autograph on it. But in the first part of Hebrews, we have these words, which I want to read to you now. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So our our dearly beloved Savior had finished, has finished the work, the work that he came here to accomplish. It's a finished, it's a done deal. But we have, rightly so, at this Thanksgiving season, to be thankful for everything that we possess in this life. All the good gifts that we have in this life come down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. But the best gift is that very hope that it was given when the promise was made in the Garden of Eden, that the seed of woman would come to crush the head of the serpent or bruise the head of the serpent, however we want to say it. Jesus came into this world, and he, with his own words is what he testified of why he came. I came to seek and to save that which was lost, and then the blessings are that I have come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. That the abundant life and the blessings of this life also come from God, who is in three persons, God our Father, God our Savior Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And in this redemption that it speaks about here in our text, we have then that beautiful message that is for the whole world. It tells us here, well, maybe I would, well, I'll read, read this first part here first. 
and every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. So if we look at the first part of this chapter, he repeats this twice in this 10th chapter, and as we have heard from some of those that would teach us how, that we should try to get things as much context as we can. And the writer here writes in this first part of this 10th chapter about God's holy and righteous law. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which were offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would there they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sin every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Therefore when he cometh into the world he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared. In burnt offerings Offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he might establish, that he may establish the second, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that offering has been made, and today, the body of Christ upon this earth are all you that are God's children and are believing in the blood that this text speaks about for the forgiveness of all your sins, together with all those that are the true children of God around the world in whatever country they live. And that body, then, is that of Christ Jesus himself. He has come by the Holy Spirit, which was not available in the Old Testament directly to the common people, but he spoke through them through the prophets. God spoke through the prophets. Yet they received praise. They receive faith, whosoever believe in the promise, even though they weren't the prophets. And it is still the same in our day, that when the word is to be preached, it is to be believed by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And we are not prophets. We don't prophesy according to the prophecy of future things. That which is to be future is all contained in this book, the promises of God were there, and that which is the promise we wait for. We're going into Advent season, and Advent season is a remembering of the coming of Jesus the first time. But there is the second Advent coming, and our text tells us how it is that we can have a sure hope and a sure foundation under our feet, and we can look for that great and glorious day that is coming. We have heard so much good word of God already this weekend that we are so thankful that again we can focus not upon our own ability even though this text speaks about the works that should come because of faith and because of the Holy Spirit. But we then, we have a priesthood now that is, has the holy ministry of which all that are called into the uh, office of a pastor, or office of an overseer, or, or even the board members. It is ordained of God, and there is authority within the church, but that authority is, as Peter would tell us all, that we with authority, or we that proclaim the word, or are the uh, pastors of a congregation, and that is our livelihood even, that we are not to be lords over God's heritage. So we have as Jesus came into this world, as it tells us we already, he humbled himself and become obedient under the death of the cross, that we then would be humbled in the presence of each other and that we would have, as we speak about, I use that word, the young children could just as well learn it. God's love is called what? In the original language in Greek that the New Testament is called agape. And that's the love that makes us humble. If we don't have God's love we cannot be humble. 
because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts that that proud man of sin, whom we are by nature, would cease to rule and to reign in our lives, that we would uphold one another in prayer, and that we would gather together around the Word of God to be edified and to be strengthened, and that we would consider, even as the Scripture tells us through Apostle Paul, we would each one of us esteem the other better than themselves. We stand today with a great need of that because we are in a country that says that there is no need for humility in anything. And we need humility. And it's the farthest thing from natural man. At least that's my experience that there is. Because the natural man is proud and haughty and sure of himself and likely despise those, especially those that he don't have perfect harmony with. Yet Jesus came not to despise anyone, but he came to save the world. But we know where our Savior is now, the 12th verse tells us. He accomplished that sacrifice for sins, and now he's before the Father. But we know what that journey was like for him. And Apostle Paul, in his testimony of his own self, and this is for you and for me, for all of us, he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live now in this flesh or in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And it is then that our self-centered, egotistical, and have my way goes out the window by the power of God and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it comes upon. It comes upon every believer as he journeys in this life. And we aren't completely free. We battle the old Adam every day. But let our, as I already said, let our love be without dissimulation, which is without partiality. I often, I've said this in my young days, I haven't said it for a long time, so I will say it again today. What we should do in our congregations and in our communities, that the person that is so, the most against us and the most irritates us, that we should by prayer and by God's grace go to that person with gifts, gifts of love and gifts of the word of God, that we would care for the souls of those that are the farthest away. There's an old English preacher one time, and he said it this way, and I, I've said it quite a few times, that, and this is me, I have a tendency to see some people that have went astray and went off into the, all the sins of this world that are so ready, the promiscuity and sexual deviant things and the drunkenness and the alcohol and all those things. My natural man says, they made their bed, let them sleep in it. Write them off. But that's not our God. That's not the spirit of God dwelling within us that takes anyone in this world and says they went too far they're gone, there's no hope for them. And we get that way many times when we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, instead of thinking soberly. That's what the scripture tells us. That we would then, as this, my mother taught me all the time, always see the best in everyone. Yet we are not by nature able to do that. Yet God has come that we would be renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created us by the Holy Spirit, that we would have that love that would be carried over here. But Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And for you today here gathered together in this congregation that goes by the name, I was in this building quite a bit before we left this area 20 years ago. Uh, many memories, many memories. Many things in the past that we can't let loose of because we are prone to be in the flesh instead of the spirit. Jesus then, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, but what did he say as he hung between heaven and earth as we heard between, about those two thieves that were upon the cross? He looked out upon the ones that were gathered there that were delighting in his crucifixion and looked about, and it reached to the end of the worlds. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Without his word coming to us and the regeneration that comes by grace through faith, as Titus 3 tells us, that we are saved not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy 
a spirit which he has shed abundantly upon us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The center of our text is our Lord. And our Lord, we heard he, this was Christ the King. He is the King. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we then, as we spoke about humility, that we, if we face the days of this life and the troubles of this life and the duties of this life, that if we could bow in front of him in prayer and ask him for the grace for the day, to not bring shame to his great name, but to glorify his name in everything that we do in this life. And we have that blessed thing that goes with us. We have all the means of grace. The forgiveness of sins is flowing in Zion until Jesus comes again, and then it will be too late for everyone. And that's what we proclaim. The blood of Jesus and his mighty name for the remission of all sins and how long does God remember that they're forgiven? He says here in our text, as we already read, he remembers them no more. Not anymore at all. And it's four times. The more witnesses that we have in the Bible, the more weight there is to that heaviness of that word of God, that it is absolutely the truth. In Isaiah and Jeremiah, he says the same thing, and he says it in the, this Hebrew epistle twice that you can be assured that, as it's been taught in some other Christianity of the world, that if you sin, you take care of it, or you won't make it to heaven. Well, I'll tell you this afternoon, hour as we gather here, that is false te teaching. It is a done deal. It has been finished. That's what the Lord said at the cross, the very end of it, before he gave up the ghost. It is finished. The work of redemption, the reconciliation, the propitiation, the atonement was complete. And today for the elderly that are here and for everybody else, middle-aged and the young families and for you children that are sitting here, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. And all I can say, if that great gift of salvation does not cause us to be humbled in his presence, and to want to love his word and to love his children, then we need to examine ourselves whether we're in the faith. Are we God's children if there's hatred and bitterness and variance and strife in our hearts? And I don't look into the heart of anybody. I, don't, I can't point fingers at anybody I know in this world and say that I know their hearts. My desire is that the blood of Jesus speaking in Zion would be heard far and wide, outside of the doors of this church building and every church building, that all of our neighbors and our friends and the ones we go to school with, that we would be given the grace and the strength to speak and give an answer of the hope that is within us of what Jesus has done. It says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we are not sanctified in the flesh. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The carnal man will not go to heaven. And he is to be subdued by that which is the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit that proceeds from the Father and the Son and abides within us. Was the devil as strong as God? Is the carnal man that is in union with the devil as strong as God? No. When God abides with us, we have victory over sin. That's the first thing on the list that's repeated, isn't it? Over sin and over death and over hell. We can stand upon that rock that is in, immutably unmovable, the rock which is Christ that we heard about already in these services. That rock, and we are sanctified then, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In the spirit and in that new man that is renewed, as we have already said, in knowledge after the image of him that created it, then we are in a good place in that fruitful hill that the prophet speaks about. We stand there, and that hill is the hill that flows with forgiveness. It's the hill of Mount Zion where Jesus' name is proclaimed and his blood is proclaimed for the forgiveness of all your sins, every one of them. I don't know, I guess sometimes it's okay to say a little bit about history and the story. What we learned when I was in this church, I went to confirmation here back in 1973 or two, I can't remember even. 
But our confirmation teacher was, uh, was Carl. And in that, as we were going through Luther's catechism, we learned the fact, as I've already spoken, that they're all paid for. God's children's sins are all paid for, past, present, and future. They're all done. So when you have those idle words that come out of your mouth, and those evil thoughts that come out of this carnal brain we had, when the conviction comes there, don't despair, because the blood of Jesus is speaking for you today before the Father. And even, as I said in our own congregation last Sunday, about how Luther says that the blood of Jesus has blinded the Father who is holy and righteous and cannot abide the presence of sin, and he does not see any of your sin as God's children. There was two fires there at Calvary's Cross. I've got to be careful or I can talk too long sometimes. There was two fires at Calvary's Cross that the, that the Lord, our Savior, was consumed with. The fire of God's eternal and infinite and undying love and then the fire of his wrath against sin. And you know who soaked up all that wrath? Every last drop of that wrath was soaked up by the Son of God. That wrath that belonged unto you and to me. He soaked it up. And God beholds his children as he has clothed them through his Son as saints robed in white. And for the elderly that are among us, I mean, the young may die and the old must die, and that comes. It comes sooner than we think sometimes. But have that assurance that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together have prepared that robe that is white and glistering for you, even as the Lord was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He has done it. He has done it. So though the devil accuse you, and though you can remember your sins of your life, just tell the devil, take it up with Jesus. Take it up with Jesus. He took care of them. And he says, as we already heard, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what the Lord has said. So have that assurance today. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us after that he had said before. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds while I write them. And who is love? It's God. When we, we, we take the Decalogue, which is eternal, the Ten Commandments that were written, they are God's will for the lives of people that would be blessed. And yes, there was once there was one sinner upon this earth, as Annie said, and I have said it before, one sinner at the cross, all the sins of the world were upon him. But also, there was only one righteous man that ever walked upon this faith of this earth too, and that was the same man, that was Jesus. There was not one sin, there was not one evil thought, there was not one idle word, there was no lack of love in him. He fulfilled, love is the fulfillment of the law, and he fulfilled it. And as we would fulfill it in this life, that we would not murder and kill and commit adultery and bear false witness and forsake the word of God, as our text even tells us, we wouldn't take the name of the Lord in vain. We wouldn't have any other gods before him. It's because of his indwelling presence, as we've already said. He abides with us. And we overcome even as the Revelation tells us by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. And I've heard this testimony and I would say it as I've heard already this time. I believe, O Lord, but help thou my unbelief. Take it away, actually. Take it away would be a good translation. Take that unbelief away from me that we then can be where Peter was when he said that even though we don't see him, we can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory because of what Christ has done. That there would be joy and peace. The unsearchable riches of Christ would bring us peace and joy. A covenant is a promise. And we already know what even the promise that comes with that 
beautiful sacrament of baptism, that we are baptized those children under the Christian church where the word of God is, which is life itself. In Matthew, he ends that when he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have taught you, and then, lo, I am with you unto the end of the world. That's the promise that the Lord gives in baptism to those that are baptized, that I am with you unto the end of the world, or to the end of life. For your older people that are close, he could come tonight. We don't know when the Lord is coming, but for your older people here, you can, you can bank on the truth of God's word, that the promise of the covenant that he has made with you in that covenant of baptism is that he will be with you until the end of your life. We have that covenant, and the desire of the heart that is regenerated is to obey God. The yeah, Decalogue is not a bad thing. But God is, as we have heard it, it's been said already this weekend, God is a perfect God, and he is perfectly holy, and we are not. But we have perfect holiness, as we already told you, in what God has done and what he has given. He has given you that robe, that covering, that is white and glistering, perfected by the Lamb of God, who laid his life down that he could take it up again, that he could come and preach to you. As my Father has sent me, so send I you. And he has sent us to proclaim Jesus Christ in this world as the only mediator between God and man. There is no other mediator, and we have him by faith then. Now where the remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. It's done. As we already said, nothing in the Old Testament that was offered on the altars and sacrifice and the blood that was shed could take away sin. It was only a shadow and a type and a figure of that which was to come that would cleanse perfectly, and would give life and peace to the souls of men burdened under that which was Adam's fall, original sin that caused all the committed sin that has come out of each one of us. And then he goes on and says, having therefore, brethren, boldness or liberty, he could say, having liberty to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The liberty to go into the holiest of holiest by the blood of Jesus. And remember how it was that only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies once a year to offer sacrifice for his sins and for the sins of the people. But the veil of the temple was written, it was rent and trunk twain from the top to the bottom. And we can enter into the holiest of holies, and we have communion and fellowship and union with the, the Holy Son of God, who is our brother. And he is also has sisters too, my dear sisters in faith. You are the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus. You have union with him and fellowship with him. And his word has been left here. The word is, to, is carried around in the Bible, but it's carried around in the hearts of God's people. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Where the living Word of God is, the Spirit is here. So the Spirit of God is with His Word. His Word is life and living. And it will, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word shall not pass away. That's what our Lord told us. So remember, to lay claim by faith to the blood that is for your remission of your sins. It's not of our efforts or our thoughts or our abilities, but as he came to us, he came to us and redeemed us, and he continually comes to us, as it says also in the first chapter of Peter, who are kept by the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The, the second coming is coming, unto that salvation from this life that is many times a battle in this life, and it's not only spiritual battles, but this body that we have is corruptible. Cancer kills our friends and neighbors. It kills our loved ones. Those that despair in their minds and are depressed and they have schizophrenia, all those things are afflictions that come upon all people. And what can we say? 
we look for that day, don't we? There will be a new body, which is fashioned like unto his glorified body, and we will be with him, and we will see him as he is. And that's by this new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Sin had been committed in the flesh, therefore sin was atoned for or in the flesh. But the sacrifice had to be acceptable unto God. One of the Christmas songs that our dear sister Martha, Carl's wife, wrote, that's what it says. God had to have an offering that was acceptable. And that offering came from heaven down to man, came down to you and to me. And that offering then we have, and we have then not a high priest like that high priest that they put a rope around his lung, neck so they could drag him out of there in case he died in there, because they couldn't go in there or they'd die. We have a high priest over the house of God who is accessible. He is as close as our brothers and sisters, but he's closer in that. He's with us in the wee hours of the morning when we wake up, and the tempter is there telling us to despair that you'll ever be successful in this journey to get to heaven. That we can say, as the scriptures are instructing us in those dark and dreary times when it's hard to face life and to face and believe. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou don't savor the things of God, but that be of men. And he is the author of despair. He was the author of the, of a, the beginning of the fall. The fall that it seems to get deeper and deeper, yet it's the same for history. You look at history and it repeats itself. And we are then in this journey, but we have a hope that is sure, anchored in heaven. An anchor that's sure and steadfast for the soul. The same Hebrew writer tells us, Let us draw near with a true heart. That is the heart that is that new heart that he gives. My brother Dan Olin, he says that we have, by God's grace, he gives us a heart transplant. And that evil heart of unbelief is taken away. Yet at the same time, we still have this part of us that is never a believer and never will be a believer. The blood of Jesus is speaking, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And the water that we are allowed to drink, drink of is that water now that we have access to that God said that they had to leave the garden because they couldn't go to that tree of life and partake of it. It tells us in the end of Revelations that whosoever will, and that's by faith, when we have faith, we are willing and we are seeking, as we heard about seeking the Lord in prayer and all those things, that we are, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. That life-giving stream that comes from the tree of life itself comes out from under the throne of God that we can be no longer thirsty all the time. The Beatitudes tell us, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, so they shall be filled our thirst is quenched by the water of life that comes from our Father and His Son and through the Holy Spirit. Even with the Holy Spirit, some have wondered, well, the Holy Spirit, where was He at with the crucifixion? But the Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit itself, and yes, abiding within you, makes, makes intercession for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. That our God was involved in every aspect of redemption. Our God in three persons, God, Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. So he has given us a new heart, and that new heart comes by faith. Uh, we, if we would just... Do I got any time left, Phil? We turn to Ephesians, and this is the second chapter here. We, we'll you just read it. This is, this is it's by faith. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others." 
But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love where he, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and by grace ye are saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, which God, but ye are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained that you should walk in them. Our text tells us, and we have the word before us uh, in the last verse of our text, that, that we should be careful to have works that are of love. Now, let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful. We have already spoke about it, but I don't know, can we hear it too much about how faithful our God is? I don't think so. Because we have the writings of Paul and Galatians of how it is that the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two, these are twain, the contrary, the one or the other, that they, the flesh is against us. That we then need to hold fast by faith. Faith is a gift of God. Sometimes, through the history of the church that I have studied a fair amount, well, there's a lot of better theologians than me by a long way. In the history of the church, the, the proneness was so much there to put together a list. Even with the Catholic Church, and I don't condemn all Catholics, I hope that in all churches, people are beholding the Lamb of God and they're trusting alone in what God has done for them. But they had, this is what you do with your sins. It's penance. It's penance. That you make satisfaction for your sins. Well, did our text tell us that penance does any good for us? To be penitent is a good thing, but penance, that you're going to be able to offer something to God to mediate the fact that you have done something wrong. Well, that's false te teaching. And the teaching of synergism versus monergism is so important. And I, I don't believe that any of the brothers here that would stand behind a Paul but teach that, that we meet God halfway. But it's in this world, and our children are exposed to that. So remember, you young families here, to teach your children that God comes to them. And he came to them in the first place when he, they were conceived in their mother's womb. And he comes by the word and the sacraments to them as they're young. And under that word, they know that God came down. And he's, as we remember, he came to earth in body at Christmas time. And then he is the one then who preserves and keeps. By the Holy Spirit, as we already said it one time already, this sermon, that proceeds from the Father and the Son. That it's not by our Ability. I cannot by my own reason nor strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord nor come to him. And I probably got wound up and didn't get that quoted perfectly. But you know what it means, don't you? It is by the Holy Spirit that we are called and gathered and, and sanctified in the Christian church. The Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit that we have already spoken about. And let us hold fast to this profession for he is faithful that promised. And I did quote that twice already here. Ron, right? Remember? <laughs> and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. So we should encourage our children. Uh, one of my sons, when he graduated from college, he was, or from high school, he was a valedictorian, and they didn't want him to uh, say anything about God or Jesus. They wouldn't let him put that in his speech that he wrote up. But he was able to get this in there, and it's true. It's never wrong to do right, and it's never right to do wrong. Is that a principle that we can trust in? I think it is. I think God's Word backs it up, doesn't it? That it's never wrong to do right, and it's never right to do wrong. So we stand there, that the works 
would be not of our own strength, but because we love. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that is given unto us. That's what Paul says. And this Holy Ghost is never contrary to the Word of God. It is with the Word, as we said. They are together in our Father and our Son. And now the end of us, our verse tells us, and let us, our text tells us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's important. It's important, and you have all these young families here. We have lots of young families. And this is the teaching. We don't need children's church somewhere else. That the families should come to church around the Word of God and worship together. And they should hear the Word of God. And, of course, it probably I didn't do a very good job. I like to speak to the children. But for you children here, as soon as you can learn to read... Read your Bible. Read it. I know that we didn't have anything to do but read at our place. We didn't have any power or electricity up there. So I read by the lantern and as soon as I could learn to read. And a lot of those things that are in my heart and in my mind about the truth of God's Word, I learned because my folks were late for church and we had to sit right up front. I I was right close to the preacher I heard him read the scriptures, and then things got implanted in my heart. So the Word of God is quick and powerful, and it is the one that separates our flesh to the place where it's dead, that we can live and walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another. We journey then with that idea that the church, the community, the church should be filled full on Sunday. Because we need not only that we had turkey on Thanksgiving and ham, everybody else here probably did, but we need the living bread that came down from heaven that we may eat thereof and not die. And that bread is Jesus. He is the bread of life. And he has come then that we can have that assurance of faith. So with that, I would just leave you with the end of this chapter to take with you at home. It is been a comfort to me for years and years and years, the exhortation of the Hebrew writer is to cast not away therefore your confidence, that confidence in Jesus, in God, which has great recompense of reward. Heaven has been prepared and it's waiting. Heaven is waiting. For ye have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise. That promise is eternal life, eternal salvation, everlasting life. Uh, That's what the scripture teaches us. That's that promise of God. It's for you. Today you can lay hold of that promise. It is that new covenant that is founded on better, better stones than that old covenant was founded upon. It's founded upon God and his love alone. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. We said it already. I'll say it again. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming to carry us from this veil of sorrows to where there's everlasting joy and rejoicing forever. Now the just shall live by faith, reaffirmed again. That's what Luther discovered. Justification is by faith. It is a gift of God. The just shall live by faith. But if in many men draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And then he tells us, but we are not of them who draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Faith and believing are synonymous terms. We believe because of the word that has quickened us. We are made alive again in Christ Jesus. And we close this with this exhortation to all of our hearts. May the glory of God be lifted up in this world, in our homes and in our churches and in our jobs, wherever we are in vocation, that the Lord would be proclaimed. O Lord, add a blessing to the continued preaching of your word this afternoon. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do I go down now?
Grace to you and peace from God the Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to the end of a weekend of service and services, and I am thankful today that I can stand here and not be tempted or required or to correct, to add to, to detract from that which has been said, but rather that we can affirm one another's messages by the reading of the scripture and the proclamation of the wonderful news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This morning as I was sitting in my easy chair, I had gotten a text from Brother Mark concerning our text this afternoon where he would be speaking. I knew where Pastor Ron and Brother Burton were speaking from, and I, I was thinking of one thing as a Christ the King Sunday, and I thought of that one verse there where we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. And I opened my Bible to Colossians chapter 1, and lo and behold, Pastor Ron spoke from part of that this morning. So we'll deal with that later. But that's okay. It really is. It really is okay. I just, I read that this morning and I thought, how can I do anything to add to this portion of Scripture? But I will read it anyway. We read the Paul's epistle to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. We read those words in Jesus' name as follows. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you in peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. I have a bit of a tight throat, and I hope I don't have a coughing fit in the middle of the sermon, but just forewarning. If I do, well, that's what it's all about. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We see here in his letter, and by the way, this is one of the prison letters, Paul is imprisoned in Rome, his first imprisonment, which you would probably call a house arrest. And during that time, he wrote the epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. We see a lot of familiarity between, especially Ephesians and Colossians, as they were coming from the same mind of the apostle at the same time, as he was suffering, suffering many things at the hands of his captors not knowing what the end result would be of his captivity there in Rome. 
History tells us that he was released and he went and he, he, he spoke, probably went as far as Spain to the, to the west, and then he was later on imprisoned and he was then put to death, martyred, as was his brother Peter around the same time under Nero in Rome. But it was during this time that Paul, an apostle, one who was sent, we read of Paul in the book of Acts that his children, God's children, would not receive the word, so I'm going to send you far out unto the Gentiles. And Paul labored more abundantly than all of the rest, but nevertheless not I, but the grace of God which was in him. He was sent of God to, to testify, to make a testimony of Jesus Christ by the will of God, as Jesus called his disciples unto him. And then he says in the book of John, as it is recorded in the 15th chapter, that you did not call me, you did not come to me, but I have called you. How Paul also was called by the will of God. For what purpose? What purpose was Paul called? That he could be the major writer in the New Testament, the epistles, the majority of them, or far majority of them are written by him. No, it's for the sake of God's people. Remember Jesus as he is speaking to his disciples just prior to his ascension, his return to glory. Tells Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Then Paul would, or Peter, excuse me, would continue with that as he would exhort the elders among him to feed the flock of God among you. The purpose that we proclaim, the purpose that Paul made a testimony of Jesus Christ is for the benefit of the hearer. That you, through the preaching of the word, would be strengthened in faith and in a lively hope of eternal life. As Brother Mark just quoted, and I think it's quoted in every sermon, isn't it? That faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. By the will of God. The will of God is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And it is through this foolishness of preaching, which Paul himself wrote of himself, that men would believe. That is the will of God. The will of God is that you would come to him through the person of Jesus Christ, who has loved you with an undying love, Timothy, our brother. We see so often in the writings of Paul the fellowship that he had one with another. We are reminded of the fellowship that we have with the Father, the Son, where the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all of our sin. But Paul brings Timothy now into this special relationship that he has with the Christians there in Colossae, along with their minister, their pastor, their shepherd, Epaphras, brings us into this relationship, this brotherhood that we have one with another. And I believe that's why I was drawn also to this text this morning, in the quiet of my living room, wondering where I would speak from. Knowing, appreciating, remembering the fellowship that we had the previous evening, last night, and the hearing of the word, looking forward to that time that you could spend together around the hearing of the word. This has been a part of my life. Thankfully, to my parents, mother who's sitting here this, this afternoon, I cannot remember a time when we were not under and around the hearing of the word. Whether it was at our small town church there in Kingston, whether it were be the conventions or the fall services or special services or being drugged along with dad to Finlayson or New York Mills or Watertown or wherever he would be going. But this is something that I don't believe that, well, maybe for some of you younger ones, you can't fully come to the, uh, the thankfulness of it. But the fellowship that we have, even in the first verse of our text here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, where we can sit together with brother and sister in faith 
and be under the hearing of the word and exhorting one another daily, even as you see the day approaching. What a wonderful blessing we have. And I'm not saying, even as Brother Mark did not say there, that we're saved by going to church. But when you go to church, you hear the word. You're strengthened by partaking of the sacrament, the body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the strengthening of your faith. Anyway, we're still in verse 1. and This was going to be just a short little message this afternoon. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, the saints, the holy ones, I was taken, not shocked, not surprised, but, but a little taken back last night as Pastor Jason said, I don't know how many times, he just freely called you saints. And isn't that what you are? You are the holy ones of God. You have been purchased out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your feet have been set upon a rock. He has established your goings. We have... In the text already read this, this afternoon, we have hope beyond the veil. We can enter into the holy of holies by the blood of, and the body of Jesus Christ. We have a, a close and personal um, relationship, ability to enter into the very presence of God through Jesus Christ, and nothing unholy can enter into his presence. So therefore, saints and brethren... Faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. The Colossian Christians had a lot of problems. We will read this short epistle, and I suppose I could encourage you to do that, as Brother Burton encouraged us to read 1 Samuel. Read this. They are not without problems. But Paul is so thankful for the fellowship that he has with those Colossians who he did not even know face to face as he had heard of their faith, as he had heard of their striving and their diligence in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostolic greeting which is so familiar and so beautiful unto us as his children. We give thanks. We give thanks. Now Paul and Timothy are giving thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. John writes in his first epistle that he rejoiced gladly when he saw of his children walking in truth. And doesn't it give us joy also when we see of his children walking in truth? When we can gather together as we have this weekend, and we can see how God is still working and taking care of his flock. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is a gift in Christ and of Christ, and of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. I said before, there's similarities between the Ephesian and the Colossian epistle. Paul writes to the Ephesians in the second chapter, verse 12, that at time you were without Christ. Writing to these pagans, these Gentiles, these people who were outside of the household of Israel. At, time, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. Having no hope. Paul writes unto the Romans, you are saved by hope. My hope is built on nothing less, we sing. They had no hope, and they were without God in the world. But now you have a hope which is laid up for you in heaven. We have an inheritance, inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. Whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, which is come unto you. We have heard over and over again, just in the last 
weekend here now, and, and sometimes these, maybe it is this way for you, it is for me, but the, the sermons begin to sort of all get jumbled up in a little, um, little bit in my, in my mind, and I can't really recall who said it or in what context it was said, but that the word of God comes to us. God's word, God's work is to us word. We learned a little bit of it just this afternoon and those two words, monergism and synergism. We believe in monergism, that is God's work toward us. We do not assist or, or, or um, partake of the, the plan of salvation along with God, but it is God's work toward us. This gospel message, the truth of the gospel, is come unto you. As it is in all the world, Jesus had a little parable, 13th chapter of Matthew, about this little, well, I'm going to read it, rather than just roughly paraphrase. It's very short. 13th chapter of Matthew, the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. This message of the truth of the gospel which has come unto them, the enemy of the soul had done his utmost to try to extinguish it from the beginning. Fifth chapter of Acts. You can read about that. The apostle there, how they were told, they were instructed, you cannot preach about this Jesus. And Peter says we must obey God rather than man. And this word which, 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 which um, or this, this mustard seed, which was such a small little seed, began there in that insignificant, dry, little I almost said God forsaken. That would be horrible for me to say that. But from the people's perspective, that's what that area was. Remember what they said of Jesus. What good thing could come out of Nazareth? And now this truth of the gospel is going, has gone out into all the world, the Roman world. By God's provision, by his making all things in the fullness of time. So when Jesus came into this world, all things were in place that this message could go out into all the world, and then it would bring forth fruit. As it doth also in you, even though they had their issues, they had their issues of, of um, vain philosophies and, and legalisms and angel worship and, and so on and so forth, but the fruit is evidenced even in them. In spite of them, the fruit is evidenced. Since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. I am so thankful to God that he takes care of his children. I know I spoke about that in the beginning, but here's a man by name, Epaphras. And we could put the ministers, the pastors, the laborers by name into this verse here, and we could be thankful for them. God has not left us alone. He visits us in our need. He visits us in our need of our sin sickness, and he answers it with the message of the gospel of good news in Jesus Christ, that, oh, though your sins be as scarlet, they are as white as snow, and though they be as crimson, they are as wool. Your sin debt has been taken care of. It has been paid for. That's what the right and the proper ministers of the gospel would preach. And Paul has nothing but praise for Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, but at the same time, we would echo the words of Jesus. 
As he looks out upon the fields and he sees that they are white with harvest, pray ye therefore, Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. This is a golden age. This is a golden age when brother can say to brother, thy sins be forgiven thee. And we are thankful for faithful servants, even as we have heard this weekend, as they have gone back now to their, or will be going back to their respective congregations and continuing to labor there as a servant, as a slave of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the message of the gospel. Our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister or slave, that's what word, that word is there, a slave of Jesus Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. It seems as Epaphras was probably a, a, um, one who would bring them a message from, from Colossae. Paul's mentioning him now as the dear fellow servant who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. There again, we do not cease to pray for each other. And how often I have been asked to pray for people, and I forget. Even the congregations that we might visit. I remember two weeks ago I was in Texas. I think I brought greetings last week from there. And they said, when you go, pray for us. You who are visiting us this weekend, when you go home and you lay your head upon your pillow, pray for us here in Hawkinson. And I would endeavor also to pray for you. As Paul writes to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, You might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The knowledge of his will is now his wisdom, spiritual understanding, walking worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. It all comes from that knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus prays of knowledge, the 17th chapter of John, This is life eternal, that ye might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is knowledge of Jesus Christ, so that we might be filled with knowledge of his will. Is that his desire is that all would come to repentance and faith. Spiritual understanding that we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This spiritual understanding is an application of this wisdom. The wisdom which is heavenly, not earthy, not sensual, but heavenly, as Paul writes to the Corinthians. Wisdom which is from above, that it would work now in you spiritual understanding and that you might work worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing created unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life of a Christian as he is exercising that wisdom which is from above. Unto the glory of God and unto the edification, the upholding, the uplifting of the congregation, our fellow brother and sister in Christ. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. Don't you get the impression sometimes that Paul just can't quite get his words out? I don't, that didn't come out right. That the words can't quite fully satisfy what God is revealing to him. And then he writes over and over and over again. The words just are tumbling off the tip of his pen, or his scribe's pen. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. Not only power, but glorious power. Exceeding abundant. Exceeding abundant glorious power. 
unto all patience and long-suffering and joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father. How many times now? I believe three times. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He hath made us meet. He has prepared us. He has made us, how would, how would we say that? Um, through his work we are now made as his children. We are made one with him. Again, it's his work toward us. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that not only are you in darkness, but he says you were darkness. And we compare that over against light. Jesus Christ is not in the light, he is light. Contrary to that, we are not only in darkness in our sin, but we are darkness. But we have been called out of that darkness into his marvelous light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. I want to read a little bit from the Catechism this afternoon. The meaning of the second article. Keeping in mind here what Paul wrote, that we have been delivered from the power of darkness and now we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear Son. We have not just been delivered out of darkness and then set upon our way. Well, then you work your way out and, you know, you know somehow you'll, you'll maybe exist on your own out there. But no, he has delivered us out of darkness and he has then transferred us or translated us into his kingdom. He has given us a dwelling place. He has given us a place of refuge, of solace, of comfort. Luther got it. The second article. What is meant by this? The second article of the Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ is true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that he is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done, that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns in all eternity. This is most certainly true. And then we go a couple pages further. Thy kingdom come. What is meant by this? The kingdom of God comes indeed of itself without our prayer, but we pray, pray in this petition that it may come also to us. Remember, this word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to us. And how is this done when our heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit? So that by his grace we believe in his holy word and lead a godly life here in time, and hereafter in eternity. He has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, wherein dwelleth righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption. We have been repurchased. We have been repurchased unto himself, not with silver nor with gold, as we just read, quoting from Peter, but with his holiness and precious blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. This is a product of justification. We've been declared righteous, holy, perfect in the sight of God through the merits of Jesus Christ. The product of that is the forgiveness of our sins, the very essence of the gospel, which is the forgiveness of our sins. And again, you can believe through Jesus Christ, his atoning death, all of your sin forgiven 
in Jesus' name and in his blood. May God richly bless us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Dear good and gracious God, we thank you again for your grace. We thank you that you grant us faith. We thank you that this faith is not of ourself, not in ourself, but this faith is on somebody else. This faith is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, the object of our faith. Dear Father, that we would cling to it, that we would be diligent in faith, ever looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we leave now from this house of prayer, this weekend of services, we ask your blessing upon us, severally, individually, and collectively. We ask that you would continue to bless us according to your good grace, not in our own merits, not in anything that we have done. In reality, we deserve nothing but punishment. But we pray, dear Father, even as Jesus promised, that he will be with us even unto the end of the world. We trust in your promises, dear Father, and we ask that you would continue to bless us as your children. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.